Greetings and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations. I'm Andy Brown. As always in this series, we talk to business leaders operating on the front lines about the key decisions they're making as the coronavirus pandemic brings the global economy to its knees. My guest today is the former CEO of the chemical giant DuPont, who now runs a technology startup that responded to the COVID virus crisis by pivoting its business to help meet the demand for medical protective gear and test walls. It's my pleasure to welcome Ellen Coleman, the CEO of Carbon, a 3D printing business based in California. Welcome to the program, Ellen. Oh, it's great to be here, Andrew. So you led DuPont out of the last global crisis in 2008. This was a Fortune 500 company. You had tens of thousands of employees, billions of dollars uh, in revenues. And now you're at the head of a startup battling through this crisis. How has the role changed? How has the challenge changed? Well, you know, it's interesting because there's some things that are just the same as you go through major crises like this, like helping your organization focus on what they can control, which is really important. And, and communication is very, very important. I think the third thing is that the world's going to evolve as a very different place. It did after the 2008 crisis and it will again now. And so how do we need to change as a company? What do we need to do to continue our trajectory going forward? You know, it's interesting to me, everybody really focuses on core values, on the value of the company, and we've learned a lot. And the major thing that's different today than it was when I was at DuPont is the agility and the resilience of 3D printing to be able to pivot from making uh, midsoles for Adidas one day, uh, helmet liners for Riddell, to making face shields and nasal swabs because of the crisis. The ability to move files around the world to really, um, you know, uh, create that resilience in the manufacturing sector is very different than what my experience was with large, long global supply chains at DuPont. So we'll get to the face shields in a moment. I want to ask you first, I mean, you brought literally a lifetime of leadership skills and experience to Carbon with you from DuPont. What were the most important of those lessons? What, what were the most important lessons you brought in handling a crisis? And what new lessons have you learned uh, at Carbon? You know, it's interesting because, you know, Carbon is a small and very dedicated team, very deep in the technology and the understanding of what it can do. And I think the most important thing any leader can do is listen to their people, is to really understand how they see how innovation can change based on the crisis. And it was really through that listening that we came up with the ideas to pivot our uh, laboratories and manufacturing partners into helping by creating products that can help with PPE um, and the nasal swabs there. So a lot of it's the same, you know, from the standpoint you really need to bring the organization together and communicate. But I think there's a lot more listening involved in, because not only the economic crisis, but the health crisis created a very, very different environment that we were operating in. What are the particular challenges for a startup in this environment? I mean, I guess, Big companies are more about systems, more about processes. We think about startups as being sort of lots of bright minds, um, huddling together in conversations, lots of spontaneity, lots of like, late nights working with each other in the office. None of that, of course, is possible now. Yeah, it's a lot harder to do that on, on uh, the video conferencing that we're all employing right now. But I, you know, I think that as, as a small company, one of the things that we've really focused on is how to find our voice to help in the midst of this crisis. We have capabilities and maybe even uh, greater capabilities than some of the larger, more entrenched companies. And so we really had to uh, focus on getting our voice out there, on understanding where the needs were, and on using our networks to be able to bring together and to do things very, very quickly within days and weeks to create a very different outcome as it was for facial shields and other areas. Have you had to follow any of your staff? No, currently we, we were able, we were going to pay our staff, um, and the good news was that the state of California allowed us to use our labs and um, to manufacture medical products. So we were able to take our people and to put them back in in safe distances and doing everything the CDC is asking us to do. 
to, um, to make facial shields, shields and to do the research and design work on the nasal swabs to be able to really uh, bring that forward. So I think there was a real coming together and people were just so excited to work on something where they thought could make a difference, that they thought would be relevant to helping in such a crisis. And it was really a rallying point for the company. I'm very proud of the way that our people responded. Are you relying on any kind of government financial support right now? No, we're not. We believe that, uh, you know, we're in pretty good financial shape. We're, we're, you know, we went through a round of financing last summer. Um, we're very careful about how we spend our money um, and we're, we're really hunkering down so that we can um, continue to do the work that we want to do. But no, I think, I think there are many other companies there that are truly in a need for that money very quickly. And, um, and I hope that they can take advantage of that. So during the last crisis, when you were at DuPont, you've spoken about how one of your biggest priorities was generating cash. What's top of mind for you now at Carbon? I think top of mind for us is what is our new trajectory? The world has changed. The world thinks about supply chains as being different. And 3D printing has always been sort of um, relegated to a prototyping, low volume, kind of environment. I mean, we've proven through our relationship with Adidas that we can do uh, relevant products, very innovative products at very high volumes at, at a cost that, that uh, is relevant to the industry. So how do we bring 3D printing more into the mainstream of manufacturing and allowing a very um, uh, resilient and agile um, supply chains to be created? As we all have seen, there's been a real need for that coming through this crisis. So certainly we're conserving cash, but more importantly, we're really understanding how our innovation can be advanced through what we've all learned around supply chains through this crisis. Well, we talk a lot about supply chains. In fact, we've talked about it on this program. And when people talk about shortening supply chains or making them more resilient about reshoring, they often talk about, in the same breath, they talk about automated technologies, advanced technologies, including 3D printing. I mean, is this the moment that 3D printing can get the economies of scale it needs to truly live up to its promise? No, I think that, you know, certainly I've spent most of my career um, optimizing global supply chains, economies of scale. And I think what we've found is that many companies are starting to talk about the need for agility as well as efficiency, that it's not one or the other, it's both. And so if you think about what 3D printing can do, you can have these printers around the world. You can, if, uh, if a natural disaster or something happens in one area of the world, you can move those files to other areas, produce the parts and get them moving. So it gives you optionality. It gives you um, a lot of opportunity to create a very different outcome when you have that agility. And so I think people are starting to rethink it. We've heard it in several industries. Certainly, we're you know, discussing this with, with many of our customers and understanding how we can then take this and create uh, a new opportunity for that agility. But do, do you think 3D printing will be a key enabler of this reshoring process? You know, I think it is going to be one of many advanced manufacturing areas that need to be, um, that are going to be required to really create that. And I think we've seen technology like ours can produce at a volume at a cost that's relevant in today's world. And I think that learning, we're, we're seeing that come through very clearly through this crisis. And I think it's our opportunity to really, um, you know, take that and bring it to um, other areas that can utilize that technology. So let's get back to face guards and test swabs. You, you really are on the front lines here. I mean, as a company, you took the decision to go on the offensive. Uh, and retool or reconfigure your 3D machines in order to make face guards and, 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 and test swabs. Can you talk us through that process, how you, how you decided to go down that road, and, and why these two products out of the hundreds or thousands yeah. you could have chosen? You know, it's interesting. Um, it happened very quickly. Face Shields first is, uh, you know, because of our interaction with other 3D players, with our production partners, you know, we got within three days of, you know, the northern um, counties in California being uh, shelter in place. You know, we had a webinar with 300 of our customers and partners talking about different ways we can use the technology to help. And the ones that, that 
that you know we collectively focused on first and foremost was face shields. It's a relatively easy headband to print. You can get PET um, cut to the right size to snap into place um, very easily. And it's something that we actually created a design. We put it open source out on the internet, allowing others to see what they could do. And you've seen a lot of that occur very locally. Certainly we produced and supplied a number of shields, um, especially into um, uh, smaller communities, for instance, the Navajo Nation, we we were able to donate shields down there with the support of Adidas and in other smaller communities that were in need. And our production partners in the dental area and other areas did the same. We felt this was something easy we could all do to to continue to drive, you know, um, our people and and focus on helping. That one came very quickly. The nasal swabs came, you know, a couple of days later when there was a real understanding of the of the um, the shortages. Um, we had uh, conversations with, for instance, an in vitro um, medical a device manufacturer called Resolution uh, Resolution Medical. One of our resin partners, Keystone. Um, our own designers started designing swabs. We did, I think, ten different designs within a week working with um, Stanford University, working with Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess. And we started down the path to really understand, you know, these swabs, which were mainly produced in Italy, which was under lockdown at the time. I think there's a small manufacturer here in the U.S. as well. And whether our 3D printing, a lattice swab, could really um, hit the mark. It's a more technical product. It has to be comfortable. It has to collect the right kind of uh, viral loading to be uh, effective. Um, it also has to work with the current, current uh, PCR types of analytical equipment to understand the outcome. And so that was really a, a, a very exciting opportunity for us to show the power of the technology. So, so the power of the technology, I mean, this technology has always seemed to be on the edge of, of, a, of a breakthrough, but never quite got across the line. I mean, is, is this the moment? Is COVID-19 the moment when it finally comes into its own? Well, I think certainly uh, Carbon and many other people in the industry are going to see how we can push that forward and really take the very real examples and the very real economics of doing what we're doing and getting that out and, and to the broader community to understand the power of it. So what if we've, we've talked about reshoring. What are the other big new business trends that you see coming out of COVID-19 that could benefit 3D printing? Well, I do think that it's not as, it's, I think it's more than reshoring. I think it's flexibility. I think it's making sure that you have, for instance, your designs in the cloud. Um, that they are easily moved from place to place and not locked into one manufacturing plant in one part of the world that feeds the world. So I think there's going to be an, a clear understanding of what are those supply chains that are required really in times of crisis? How do we create uh, much more flexibility there, much more agility there? And it starts with the design and it follows right through then to the production of the part. Um, and so I do believe that those types of opportunities are going to be there, not only for our industry, but more broadly along the supply chain. So before COVID-19, carbon was in rapid growth mode, which I presume is the reason that you're in, you're in the company, what's what attracted you to, to carbon. How do you think about the next few months, the next few years? What's the new normal, if you like, for carbon? So I think we've, we have used this time to really understand how we can leverage our design for DLS, our technology out into the design community. How do we do more education remotely? Um, you know, we've put new educational programs out there for our customers. How do we engage more in the design community to create those opportunities for 3D printing and create that agility in the supply chains going forward? So I think we're looking at things like really on the front end, on the design side, on how we can get more into the pipeline there, working with our present production partners who've been just tremendous during this crisis at being able to do and move into doing more medical opportunities, and really um, listening to them, hearing from them. Because my biggest concern around the crisis, and especially being distant, is that innovation slows down. And so we're being very focused on how do we continue to create the innovation pipeline, um, which we were doing with personal visits and, you know, getting together and all those things that we normally do to create ideas and, and have that creativity flowing. 
Ellen Coleman, it's been a pleasure. Good luck as you do your bit to bring the world to a the post COVID world to a better place. Thanks for your time and thank you for your insights. Great, thank you, Andrew.